1977, Frontline broadcast a film called Growing Up Online. You need to have the internet on to talk to your friends because everybody uses it. Good morning. Please welcome Chairperson of the Community-Wide Parent Ed Collaborative Committee of Davis, Karen Lake Sloan. Is it on now? Yep, very good. Okay. Um, so the topic for today's event came about when all of the reps from the various schools got together and talked about what was most concerning or what was most on our radar screens today as parents. And parenting and information age came up for everyone, whether you had elementary school, preschool, high schoolers, anyone in between, because it, it hits all of us almost every day. I know just this morning I got emails from some hobo hotel online. So one of my kids is playing online, put my email address in, and every single day there's something like that going on for all of us. So we've assembled for you today some local experts on this topic who will speak with us about what's going on out there today and I know that when I met with a few of these folks, I was shocked at some of the things that are happening out there and some things that we can do as parents to be more prepared to address them. Our moderator for today's panel discussion is Ms. Pamela Wood. Um, Pamela is a broadcast journalist who worked for several years at Channel 3 KCRA in Sacramento and um, is currently the UC Davis Law School Director of Marketing and Communications. Pamela continues to work in broadcast journalism. You may have heard her recently on Capital Public Radio um, and the NPR affiliate in Sacramento as she does a documentary show on there. Um, in addition, Pamela uh, sits on the National Board of Directors of the Asian American Journalists Association. Pamela is mom to 15-month-old Eric, who does not have an iPod nor an iPhone just yet, <laughs> but I've told he's very proficient at swiping the screen to get to where he wants to go. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Pamela Wu. Thank you very much, Karen. Good morning. It's great to be among so many Davis parents and caregivers once again. As Karen mentioned, I am mother to a 15-month-old, and um, since Eric is at the age where his favorite activities are banging on pots and pans and squishing mud between his chubby fingers, you would think that technology's reach would stop short of his everyday toddler existence, but you would be wrong, because all of the pot banging and Play-Doh pounding and mud squishy comes to a screeching halt whenever he sees mommy or daddy's iPhone because it is captivating. And without my having to teach him, simply through observation, as Karen mentioned, he's learned to scroll through the photos. Did you know that they have more than 1,000 apps designed for babies and toddlers? They have names like Wheels on the Bus and I Go Potty. So you cannot deny the ubiquity of technology if smartphone apps are marketed to someone who still wears a diaper. So from privacy issues to texting while driving to cyberbullying and concerns about health effects, the phenomenon of technology is a concern for doctors, psychologists, and parents the world over. So today we're going to hear from a panel of experts on technology and childhood development. But first, let us briefly recognize our Davis Joint Unified School District administrators. When I call your name, please stand or raise your hand so you can be recognized. With us today is Winfred Roberson, District Superintendent. <laughs> Michael Lady, Counselor for Emerson. <laughs> and Cara Leppington, Counselor for Da Vinci Junior High. For today's panel discussion, we will be talking with local experts about the developmental, behavioral, social, and even legal implications of kids on technology. We're going to have about a 45 minute discussion, and then we're going to take a Q&A from you, the audience. If you have a question during the program, please feel free to jot it down in the index card that you were given when you arrived. If you'd like, you can also write down the name, uh, your name, your school, and the age of your child as well. Now let us welcome our four expert panelists. Pamela Mari is the Executive Director of Student Services and Secondary Programs for DJUSD and was the founding principal of Da Vinci Charter Academy. <laughs> Ms. 
Mary Kay Hull is a nationally recognized family online safety expert, mother of five DJ USD students, and founder and president of Your Sphere Media Inc. Her company focuses on the family and publishes the kids' social network, YourSphere.com. Mary Kay is also an ABC 2020 contributor and has been profiled on CNN, the BBC, and the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Stephen Nowicki is a developmental and behavioral pediatrician with his own practice right here in Davis, the Davis Developmental Pediatrics Group. Steve is also medical director for Summer Developmental Clinic and a board member for the Yolo County Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health Advisory Board. Crystal Calloway Jaime is the supervising attorney for the UC Davis School of Law Family Protection and Legal Assistance Clinic. She supervises law students in various projects as they gain practical legal experience. And one of the projects that Professor Jaime currently supervises focuses on raising awareness regarding the legal consequences of cyberbullying, sexting, and sextortion. Please welcome her. are living, there's my mic, are living in the information age. Technology, of course, surrounds us everywhere. And so there's likely not a parent in this room who doesn't have a child engaged in some kind of technology device or internet <coughs> access. So let's begin with where we stand today. What, what, how children are benefiting from technology. Let's start with you, Pam. Why is technology in our schools? That was not a list of <laughs> <laughs> Well, what, what can you talk about when it comes to the role of technology in our schools? What are you seeing these days? The trending that we have in technology is, I think, um, can be characterized in a couple of ways, which I think I'll speak to more detail later. But that is that it is a constant, uh, a constant test, a constant balance, weighing the advantages, the opportunities, the expansion of knowledge with uh, what is developmentally appropriate, what is safe. She's now 18, 
about what was going on in social media, on the social networks that kids are participating in. This is now six years ago. Obviously, social media is part of all of our lives, but I was absolutely, deeply concerned about the privacy issues and some of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later. So as a solutions and education-oriented education company, your sphere is designed to provide kids all of the great things that social media offers them, but while teaching them the importance of why their privacy matters, uh, digital citizenship, and providing an age-appropriate environment. Your sphere for parents is your information resource so that when you go home, and for all of you parents whose children either have an iPhone or an iPad or an Android or an Xbox or the Wii, that you know how to activate the safety settings because you likely have them on your home computer, but you likely don't have the safety settings enabled so that your kids don't see the inappropriate content. And finally, uh, our education nonprofit, the Coalition for Internet Safety Education and Reform, is designed to give schools, communities, and families free education resources. Six years ago, too, that was when MySpace was a big deal. Who uses MySpace anymore? <laughs> right? Yeah, it just goes to speak to how, how quickly it things changed. are moving. Um, Dr. Nowicki, as a practicing pediatrician, talk to us about how technology plays a role in, in your practice and the patients that you see. Well, technology um, is, is a really big word. Yeah, this is something I can't tell. Um, <laughs> is, is a really big area to talk about. I think there's a lot of benefits that come from technology, and there's a lot of traps for, for families and for kids. And we tend to talk about kids in terms of a block of and, and they contain all ages of infants. You mentioned you're a 15 month old. Mm -hmm. um, and what to do at, at certain ages throughout a child's life and, as, and to prepare them to be successful as young adults and adults. And as the video showed, the things that we might be thinking of as preparing them for concretely is not gonna exist in five years, four years. So how do you do that in a way that allows them to, when the new thing comes along, they have to adapt, be thoughtful about it, be critical of it, and actually be successful with it. Um, so in developmental behavioral pediatrics, there's an explosion in terms of technology to help kids with autism, with developing social skills. There are computer programs that are used to help support working memory, or computer programs and interactive software that help children with anxiety disorders. So in terms of treatment approaches, there's an explosion in this area. Um, however, it's probably 0.001% of software. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for kids. Um, I'd really like to kind of back it up, back it up a little bit in terms of your pots and pans uh, thoughts. Because if you look at children under the age of two, there's zero data that anything that has blinky lights or, or has or anything on a box that says this is the software to help your infant develop faster, better, smarter. There's zero data for that. Most data point to pots and pans, mm -hmm. unstructured play, playing with blocks for language development, playing with their families face to face, with people. Um, that if you look at data for small children in terms of technology versus just with people, people, playing with people is actually more important. Now that doesn't mean that that continues through the adolescent period. So you have to actually help build those communication routes for kids. So it's really about communication, really about early childhood support and development, so they have the tools that they do. I'll keep encouraging them to bang on those pots and pans, so my earplugs in. Um, Professor Jaime is my colleague at the UC Davis School of Law and the Family Protection and Legal Assistance Clinic has been putting on a lot of seminars in our community. Some of you may have attended um, one or more of them on cyberbullying, sexting. Tell us why the Family Protection and Legal Assistance Clinic at UC Davis became involved in these issues of technology. Historically, our office has represented low-income victims of domestic violence. Um, but students look for opportunities other than traditional legal litigation to get involved in um, assisting individuals with legal matters. Quite a few of our students are really interested in working with families and teens, and so 
I asked my students to come up with a presentation dealing with issues related to teen dating violence issues and technology, if they found any, and immediately, in less than a week, they came back to me and they said cyberbullying and sexting. And I said, run with it. And what we started finding out is that this is an emerging area of the law. Um, the ramifications for teens, particularly, is huge in just opportunities to have a potential criminal record, to school discipline being on your record, having to impact your college applications, job choices, um, and just in general, your reputation in the high school community. Um, however, as we started looking into it, the thing we started realizing is that this is a huge legal issue. Um, the dating violence issues are only one small aspect of it. Education code and the ability of the schools to discipline on one side, free speech issues on another side, um, civil liabilities for the schools on one side, civil liabilities for parents. I don't think a lot of parents realize that if their, chil if their children do something online that is actually considered criminal conduct, they can be held liable for the monetary fines and the restitution and the other um, fees that the child might have to face as a result of that. So this is a huge issue It's developing. And just as we can't predict what the technologies are going to be, the laws are trying to keep up with that. The legislature is working very hard at trying to really draft laws that will deal with these issues, but with the understanding that the technology of today, the Facebook and the Twitter, may not be the technology that everybody is using two years from now. And so they need to have something to address these issues, but at the same time, make sure it's something steady as, well, as the technology changes. I think I'd like to get a show of hands so we have an idea of how old your students are so that we can hear our conversation. Um, who here has children kindergarten or younger? Okay, and then how about in elementary school? Okay, a lot of elementary school parents here. Middle school and high school? Okay, so now we know. Um, Pam, why don't you talk to us about, in school, what are the top concerns um, regarding you know, kids and teens these days? Not necessarily 
incredibly suited technology is for teenagers. It's fast. It's uh, a little risky. It has no upward limit. It is secret. It is independent on one hand, and is highly social and high connectivity on the other. So all of that is wildly, wildly um, student, well, connected, I guess you'd say, to the developmental um, aspects of the child. And every one of those, every one of those things would be a reason to say it's not suitable for that child if it actually enhances speed, impulsivity, uh, pressing the limits, a secret life. Then there, we're back to that balance issue again. Those uh, those two trends are very important, and I think a third one that um, has to be mentioned is that there is a raging argument going on in the education community nationwide, worldwide, it's worldwide, about what exactly instructional technology is. So, are we having technology for technology's sake? Are we having it because it's enhancing lessons and skills? Or are we having it because, as the, as the video mentioned, it's bells and whistles that are highly stimulating to students. You saw a picture of, the, of a brain on Google. Well, it looks a lot like a brain on meth. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. <laughs> so what exactly are we doing with the technology? If we buy a smart board, but we use it like a whiteboard, who cares? If we buy everyone iPads, but it's the same as a pen and paper, who cares? On the other hand, we invest in robotics, and it's hands-on, mechanical, spatial. Um, it promotes math and engineering. We probably have a good, <laughs> yeah, have a good idea there. So we are in the throes, truly, of making sure that we are spending those tax dollars appropriately to enhance the education of students at the same time Research can't keep up. I think that's what Mary Kay said about yeah. this. In the exponential <laughs> speed. The research can't keep up with what works and what doesn't before there's something else. And uh, we, we have to do a lot of things by the seat of our hands and keep that student centered focus at all times. It's not necessarily popular, but what we hope is right. About two or three years ago, there was a study that came out that said that students were having a more difficult time concentrating and even staying awake in class because they were texting all night over time. Are you still um, seeing that? Like we that absolutely question? see that. And parents will, parents will lament that they cannot get their child to school on time because they're staying up late till late at night. Um, there are solutions for that. There are solutions for that. We're talking about that. Shut it off. And who's in charge of this house anyway? Mm -hmm. um, the the we, we see that we also see tremendous amount of peer pressure on social media, mm -hmm. and we also see um, the, a very curious thing. Perhaps Dr. Willie he can address it because we, we don't understand it in terms of brain development yet. And that is that students have a sort of avatar mentality that is very hard to, to grasp. Um, I have said in the writer of the device here, I, I have sat in rooms with students who are in terrible trouble. And we say, this is your phone, that you're telling us you didn't do this. You didn't say this. And they say, but I'm not like that. Mm. And we say, this is your phone. <laughs> this is your phone, and this is what it says. And then there's tears and anger, but I'm not like that. You don't understand. That's not really me. You hear this, and hear this, and hear this, and hear this. It's like their alternate existence. It is. That's what I say. It's, it's an avatar behavior. That's all there. And how beautiful for a child of any age to be able to oppress, impress, or express and impress new identity and new identity limits, particularly in the preteen years. And that is where we, we have the, the clash of what's going on outside of what's going on in school, and if and how school can and should address it. Okay, that's really illuminating there. Hey, can you comment on what Kayla said? Uh, absolutely, and I was thinking of courage behind the keyboard. Um, and But I think if, in, in addition to that, what sets all of this up, if you will, regarding, and we have slides 
But there are some top concerns that uh, really set this up. Um, and, and it's number one, it's lack of parental involvement, parental, parental involvement, parental education, and parental supervision with these devices, whether it's the laptop or the phone. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we need to be, teach personal responsibility. And a lot of the pitfalls I can tell you can absolutely be avoided when you're digitally educated, digitally involved in what your kids are doing, because the consequences can be dire. Uh, and dire ranging from exposure to, of course, inappropriate content. We all know that kids see porn, they stumble upon it, but likely, you know, again, if you haven't safety enabled your digital device, you know, have your kids type, they can certainly type in a few words and see what you protect them from seeing on the, on the computer. Um, sites like Facebook, it's against a federal law called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act for any child under the age of 13 to be on Facebook or Twitter, my yearbook. The culture in Facebook is adults intended. It's a very different experience that you have as a parent on Facebook than your child does. No, every child isn't going to go play, for example, SimSocial on Facebook. SimSocial allows your child's avatar to get naked and have sex with their friends. You're not playing that game. Smash or Pass, one of the most popular groups in Facebook. The goal of Smash or Pass, I learned this, um, thanks to my older daughter who told me that, mom, Smash means to have, you'll want to have sex with someone. So you put your picture up in the Smash or Pass group, and adult men, 20-something-year-olds will comment on your 12-year-old daughter whether or not they smash her or pass her. But that's a reality of what's going on in Facebook that I will argue is unhealthy for our kids in terms of their digital participation. Privacy, huge, huge issue. The fastest growing segment of identity theft is among children. Because why? They're signing up for sites asking them that are asking them when they should not be for information such as first name, middle name, last name, date of birth, IM, email, uh, exact physical location. The, this camera on your, the, the, on your child's phone has something, in you heard of geotagging? Um, geotagging literally tracks the coordinates of where your child is. So your child takes a picture, they upload it to Facebook, they upload it to Flickr and or uh, snap, snap, not Snapfish, but definitely to Instagram. Mm -hmm. There's an, an exact digital coordinate to where your child is. And people can see that. And people can see so, it. So if your child takes, snaps a photo of, check out this new poster in my bedroom. Right. Someone can find within two feet where your child lives. Guess what? You don't have to worry about it. You go home and turn off the, the tool that enables those coordinates to take place. We show you how to do it. You'll strip your parents. But you need to understand that that, that we're talking about privacy issues, we're talking about content issues, we're talking about your kids participating on Facebook who's been fined by the FTC for deceptive privacy practices. We talked about sexting. I've had this conversation with my three boys. Philip Albert, 17 years old, dating a 16 year old. She sent him naked photos. They break up, he's 18, senior in high school. He gets mad. He chooses to send those photos to a couple of friends, grandma and grandpa. Guess what? He's now a registered sex offender at the age of 43 years old. Felony distribution of child pornography. The laws cannot keep up with the technology. 14-year-old girl uploads her, her naked photos to her Facebook profile. She was charged with felony distribution of pornography. A young, a young girl in Ohio, 17 years old, she sent her boyfriend naked photos. He shared them with over 300 uh, different high school students. She killed herself because of the names that she was called for the mistakes. Now, when I talk to my kids about you will never get in trouble when somebody else does something stupid with their technology, but you need to tell me, you need to talk to me, you need to understand that that picture that your friends might take posing a certain way sends their own message and can very, very easily get another child in trouble. And those are things that, you know, we as parents, you know, need to be able to understand and, and certainly deal with. And then the last two items I want to share with you regarding um, texting and driving. I don't know if any of you heard this story just two weeks ago in the Bay Area, the 17 year old boy that lost control of his car while texting and killed a, a father and daughter of bike riding home. If you text and drive, you are over 400 times, 400% more likely to you know, not be focusing and putting around the wheel. There are tools, mom and dad, that you can use to turn texting off, take the illumination away. Um, and then sexual predation. I know we get bored, we hear 
porn, it's important to understand that one in five children are sexually solicited online. 14% of 9 to 14 year olds and 12% of 15 and 18 year olds said yes, I'll go meet you in person, I've met you online, I don't know you. 75% of those kids had some type of sexual abuse because of that encounter. You have to be talking to your kids about who they're talking to online. And if they don't know them in real life, they should not be friends with them online. And that's not something by just being your child's friend on their social media account can prohibit that from happening. Because even though you're, you may be your child's friend, unless there's a tool like you provide parents in your sphere, where you can see what your child, 12 and under, has been doing on the site, then you have no idea the interaction that's going on. And then the last point is, guess what? The FTC has made it okay for any school or organization to do a social media background check on your child, on you. They want to go to college. The FTC at a college can go and look and see seven years worth of data that your child has been posting online. My son, who's now 13, talking to him, he's intent on getting a college scholarship, wants to play at a Division I school. I told him, you know, Jack, what kids are doing and posting on Facebook can keep, because it has, kids from being able to get into the schools that they want. So there are some severe consequences. So things we need to have solutions for. We'll talk about some of those solutions too. Mary Kay is going to give us some very specific um, instructions and tips that you can take home with you and put to use today. You mentioned sex date and cyberbullying, and Crystal has a lot of experience with this. And maybe you can you can tell us about your work with cyberbullying, and maybe give us some examples as well. So cyberbullying, I think a lot of parents think of it, and they think of kids being online and calling each other names. But kids from kindergarten and even preschool through high school are very sophisticated in their uses of technology. But as sophisticated as their use of technology is, a lot of times their judgment is nowhere near their sophistication. Yeah. They're still kids. Exactly. <laughs> and so what, what we're seeing a lot of is cyberbullying is really a myriad of issues. So you have kids, even young kids sometimes, making up fake identities and then posting, for instance, creating a fake Facebook page and then taking you know, photos that aren't that complimentary of that person and posting them and then basically using this page to pick on that person, spread rumors about them, or even post things as that person, um, maybe mean comments towards another student that that person is best friends with to try and interfere with their relationship. And these are innocuous examples of some of the things that kids do when they make up fake identities online. Um, kids are also very trusting, um, oddly enough. It's suspicious of their parents, right? But in their <laughs> peer community, it's, no, this person was really just trying to be my friend. And so sharing passwords or very personal information that someone can easily guess your password or your login ID, and then giving someone access to their account information that way. Um, chatting with strangers online. One of the big things that parents also don't realize <coughs> with cyberbullying is not just the different types of cyberbullying that goes on, but the different platforms for the cyberbullying. So we've talked a lot about Facebook. <coughs> we've talked a little bit about iPhones, but what about iPods? I mean, there's Wi-Fi and you can connect using Wi-Fi if your child has an iPod. And so kids can access the internet if they have an iPod pretty much anywhere these days, because Wi-Fi really is anywhere. Head-to-head um, -head gaming, online, Xbox Live. Kids have been gaming for years. I'm going faster than you, I'm hitting harder than you. Whatever game it is they're playing, but when they're online, because there is a difference in their computer screen tech persona, they are escalating these types of comments to a much higher level, to very violent threats sometimes, um, really inappropriate comments about family members, about other friends. And so cyberbullying is much more than just your traditional name calling, or even, I hate to say it, threats. And it can really take on all of these different levels, all of these different versatilities, and that's what the schools are having to confront. You know, you think you've seen everything, and then you walk into a classroom, and my students will talk with teachers, and they'll be like, we're having this issue. And it's like, okay, we haven't seen that one before, but I can totally see where that's coming from. <laughs> um, and this is what teachers are dealing with, and it's taking up your children's instructional time as well, and teachers are frustrated by this. The sexting is another huge concern. Um, the in the moment, 
America in the now, the danger that kids can get into. We've talked a little bit about predators being online, and I think a lot of times when kids are sexting, they really, you can tell them, but they truly do not process the long-term ramifications. And like, like Mary Kay was saying, in California, if a child is caught sexting, if they take the picture of themselves, they can be charged for creating child pornography. If they take a self portrait, yeah. for taking a self portrait, they created a photograph of a child that was sexually explicit, and they themselves can be charged. Um, if they forward the photo, or even if they show it to enough someone without even forwarding it to it, that's disseminating child pornography. Um, and the thing is, in California, even the mere possession of child pornography is a potential criminal charge. Now, I haven't personally heard any stories of district attorneys who are charging kids because they innocently received a sex message because I'm hearing this is very common with male boys. Right. Um, but you get a child who's, I was just talking to the public defender, and their concern is you get a child who's involved in some other kind of activity or having difficulties, and that child is going to be monitored much more closely, and so something might actually innocently happen to them, but the potential for those criminal charges is very, very real. And the sex offender registration, if a child is charged with something like that as a result of sexting, is a lifelong obligation in most circumstances. And now for juveniles, that is also going to be a part of the public record available on Megan's Law with some very rare exceptions. So before it used to be that sex offender registry was a serious consequence for a juvenile, but now it's even that much more serious. And so we go into the classroom and we really try and educate the students on Think before you press enter. Think before you click. You know, just, it is so easy. It only takes two seconds to have a lifetime of an impact on the legal consequences. Uh, Crystal mentioned um, students sharing passwords, kids sharing passwords with one another. That's like the new pinky swear. You know, it's that, oh, we're, we're best friends now, BFFs. We can share passwords. It's also, from what I understand, it's like, oh, my new boyfriend trust each other, it's this it's sort of, we're taking our relationship to the next level, we're sharing passwords. That is really dangerous for students, kids to be sharing passwords with one another. Um, Steve, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, recently published an article in Facebook Depression. What is that? Um, it's really kids really just falling into this virtual world, seeking out really thoughts of being, um, showing, well, Let's start with depression. I mean, it's all the same symptoms of depression, but it's basically kids becoming self-isolated um, with no real support structures around them, having the same clinical structure or symptoms of depression, um, and really lacking a lot of uh, social connection. I mean, one of the, you know, there was a recent really scary story about, um, and it involves a bit of, I guess, sexy in a way, but where a uh, college roommate had videotaped um, his roommate having sex um, and then posted it online and talked about it. Um, the young man who found out that his sexual activity had been posted online committed suicide. Um, certainly one event like that, as even as egregious as that, is not going to cause someone to commit suicide. So also a young man who was posting online uh, lots of comments about how he was feeling, reaching out to this virtual world, uh, how he's feeling, and this depressive symptoms and such. That went into the cyber world, and, and he never got any help. And then this one last thing was the tipping point for a depressed individual, and then commit suicide. So it's that disconnection where you can be on Facebook, it's immediate, it's fast, it's it, it, uh, um, So you post a picture, you get 14 people liking your picture, liking what you say, and it just it gets you a buzz, and then when you're in the real world, it's not there. For us, we have that perspective that, well, yeah, that's on Facebook. Um, and for children, that perspective isn't there. Um, what do you mean I'm not, you know, like walking around with a little light bulb? But 
scared in that for a couple of reasons. One is I don't want everyone leaving saying, okay, we're going to shut down um, and being very uh, authoritative about it and saying you're not going to do it because you can ruin your whole life over it if you do all of this. You know, kids are biologically programmed to take this, be impulsive, to define over time who they are and define themselves as an individual. That is biologically. DNA, they're very, I mean, it is how people become individuals. The problem is that they've been given a space where it's perceived to be safe. And it's horribly risky. But it doesn't seem to It's computers. Yeah. So when we, you guys out here are the most powerful people to change that. And, and it comes, you mentioned teaching it or going into the classroom and telling it. That, I don't think, if you keep it real, does it? It's, it's helpful. It's marginal. But it's not as effective as, from a very early age, modeling, modeling how you handle your technology, how you handle your media, how you engage it, and how you refuse to not disengage your kids. Uh, I see one of the most disturbing things for me over the last four or five years is um, moms or dads and their strollers with small infants in their strollers and they're texting on the phone and the kid's like almost curling backwards over the top of this thing trying to get eye contact and, and some interaction with their family and there's nothing there. They become disconnected, uninterested and then when they finally take something out of their crib and whirl it at someone and, and hit someone with just to finally get some attention, then they, then they're like, then they're punched, and it's so, it, and it's, and it was totally, it's like driving while you're texting. You know, you're gonna crash into a tree if you're parenting while texting. The kid's gonna throw something at the tree. I mean, so maintain, you know, staying engaged with your kid, knowing what's going on. Let your kids teach you what's going on. But what you're not doing. Okay, it's but they're going to be the ones that are actually going to be up on the technology more than you guys. So the dialogue and being sensitive to what they're doing, being firm about your own family values of where you want that to be, and engage them in debate and engage them in discussion to have them talk about. One of the most important things you said is that if you run into this, I want to know about it, please tell me, because I want to help. Um, it's like one of the most effective drunk driving, teenage drunk driving programs. If you happen to be at a party and you're drinking, call me. If not, I'm not going to punish you. I'm just going to come pick you up. We'll talk about it the next day. You know, it get, there's, a, there's a time lapse there, and you model that. You know, if you have a teen, you know, an 18-year-old driver or 17-year-old driver in your home, and you've gone to a party, and you're like, oopsie, had too much to drink. And you call your 18-year-old son and say, hey, I've had one too many beers, can you come pick me up? Sure, Dad. I'll do it. For sure, Mom. I'll do it. And he's probably not going to wait until the next morning to pick him up. But, <laughs> but, but you've just created a situation where he's like, okay, that's right, that's the way to do it. So modeling is so important. No, that makes that absolutely makes sense. It's just like you know your developmental pediatrician will will tell you that the best way to teach your kids manners and to say please and thank you is not to tell them to say please and thank you, but to say please and thank you yourself and to, to the child. To and to the child and to and to model the behavior. Um, I know that you were paying close attention yes. to what I Steve was saying because um, part of part of why I'm, I'm so happy that Mary Kay's out there giving the message and what Steve said is that. Just as there's this separate avatar mentality, that, or, so that I'm calling it for the day, for lack of a more research-based uh, uh, expression, there's a curious parallel to the parents, such that, for example, some parents, the same parent who has carefully made play dates in nursery school and has made sure that language classes started at the proper age, very, very careful monitoring. 
sometimes associate the, the social media and the technology life with my child's generation. It's sort of that hands off, um, that's, oh, you know, they're like that. It's one of my favorite cartoons is um, Zits. Have you seen that cartoon? Mm -hmm. and, and I have a bunch of them laminated in my office about technology and, and uh, teenage development. This notion that the, the parents are, they watch, they're amazed, they don't understand, but they are separate from that action. That is my child's world that they're living in, and I'm not in that. Where the same parent would never allow them to roam around cities they don't know, or to just completely give up human interaction, or to break laws just willy-nilly, impulsively. So the message I think you're going to all hear today is that from the, the technology has rendered the past educating and parenting model obsolete. We used to be, parents were and boy teachers were, the arbiter of knowledge. We got to decide what was good knowledge and what was bad knowledge and what you will be taught and what you will not be taught. Technology has rendered that obsolete. Neither parents nor educators can be sages on the stage anymore. This is a collaborative process. It demands collaboration. It demands that the student is both parties, the teacher is both parties. And then, from an education point of view, either the teacher or the parent as educator does need to claim the final judgment because that is the adult position to take. We do have experience. We are charged with that final decision about how things will um, be used, not used, happen, not happen, which is part of what uh, the tools are about. But the process is collaborative, but it should be in the classroom. We're struggling to make a new a cyber culture, a positive cyber culture, at the same time as we're making positive classroom culture, positive campus culture, and so on. So please consider that we will have to get your hands on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And you will have to say to the child, how do I open that? Show me what that does. And be a partner in the learning. So you just answered my next question, which was exactly what can parents do today if they indeed want their kids to enjoy technology in a safe and positive way. It's for parents to really get up to speed and get involved. Let's turn to Mary Kay now for um, some really practical tips about um, coming up to speed for parents who are often less tech savvy than their kids. Um, what should they know when they, and I'm going to take some things off, when they give their child a cell phone, give their child a smartphone, um, give their child internet access, and so forth and so on. Can I answer that in 20 seconds? <laughs> because I, I just want to, Steve touched on the fact that a lot of negative things. I want parents to feel good about their kids' use of technology. I want them to feel good about social media. Um, when it's in the right context, in the right environment. Because unlike any other media, uh, where radio you listen, the songs are created for you, TV, someone picks the sh shows. Social media, our kids are the collaborators, they're the contributors, they're the writers, they're the architect, they're the content. There are many wonderful things to be had from social media. So don't feel bad about social media. Just make sure it's you know the right social media because good things can happen. And our kids are picking up digital literacy skills, whether it's learning how to upload a photo, HTML, CSS. Those are things that as contributors, either to their education um, or to getting into college or a job, they're acquiring skills that they absolutely need. So feel good about it. It's not about my husband five years ago said, Mary Kay, our life was simpler when there wasn't the cell phone, there wasn't the computer. Let's get rid of that and everything. And I said, sweetie, let's go in the backyard, dig a hole, stick our head in it. It's not <laughs> going away. So, so please feel good about the use of technology. Just be involved. So to answer your question, mm -hmm. um, what you should do is first breathe. <laughs> then go home and make a commitment. Make a commitment that you will start the, you will start the dialogue today, you will continue the dialogue. You will talk about technology with your child as much and as often as you do about uh, you know, drink well, depending on the age of your child, of course, um, kindness, how you are in the play yard, what you do at school, alcohol, safe sex, all the topics that you as a parent will talk about. When it comes to the actual digital devices, 
your go-to resource for information is your sphere, Y-O-U-R-S-P-H-E-R-E for parents.com. You need to safety enable all of the digital devices in your home, and that's not difficult to do. It'll take an initial commitment of two hours of time. I literally laid, we have laid on our kitchen table, we have uh, three laptops, an Xbox, two Vs, our Netflix account, an iPad, two iTouches, a non-smartphone, and a desktop. You can safety enable those devices. Now that's just the foundation. That's the foundation. Because once your child is a digital participant, they need to be learning and practicing good digital citizenship skills. They need to be hearing from you. And I'll, I'll share a story about what's not okay. One of my sons, when I was up his brother's iPod touch, and texted someone and said something mean under his brother's name. So we went to that family and we apologized for what my son said to the other kid. He was, you know, just being funny. Didn't really mean it. Um, that, yeah, that was, he was really giving his brother, but that was mean. So we need to take and teach personal responsibility. Um, when it comes to cell phones, I recommend starting slow for the parents, for the parents who have kids in it. Depending when you decide to get your child a cell phone, I recommend that you make it a cell phone or a social media site. I'm sorry, I'm jumping over the place on topics. I had this nicely organized. Um, let me start with social media. The child's under the age of 13. They do not belong on Facebook. Not only is it against the law, it sends a message it's okay to lie. That's not a overall good family message, of course. And, and there are the many inappropriate things we've talked about. There are age appropriate alternatives. Um, when it comes to the gaming accounts, my son doesn't like this, but we don't buy the live version. I would know way too much about the things that go on in the live version, and it's not a healthy culture. If you want to play live, get your friends over in the house, and they do, they play live in the mm -hmm. house in person. Cell phones, start slow. Uh, give your kids a chance to follow your rules. At your for parents, you can download a technology contract. All of my kids, my two older ones are in college, but at some point, everyone in my house signs a technology contract. There are clear rules about what's appropriate, what's okay, what's not okay. If they break the rules, and we had a discussion about, you know, they wanted to add some of the rules, like on the weekends they could play Xbox more than, you know, during the week. 15 minutes a day wasn't enough for Xbox during the week, but there always seems to be homework or sports. So they had input on what some of the rules are. But if you give your kids the clear boundaries that teach and tell them what's okay for technology, use and the way to act and the way to use their tools they know what the consequences are that's a wonderful place to start there is it eliminates all the arguing that happens because you can go back to the contract and say look you signed it you understand you know what the consequences are so do that um, i also recommend that um, you don't allow your children to use video chatting sites we only touched a little bit on sextortion but unfortunately um, just to tell your kids you know what our family we don't do video chatting sites you don't need to tell them the names of the video chatting sites, just uh, say no video chatting sites. Um, what I said earlier, make it easy, easy for your kids to follow the rules. Um, I've used this in my house. AT&T Smart Limits allows you to turn off texting during the school day. Now, the end of the overnight hours. Yeah, and, and, and at night. So I, our rule in our house was the phone needs to be downstairs at night. Someone would come downstairs after mom and dad were bed and bring the phone back upstairs. Mm -hmm. Or take out the SIM card and put it in another device. Well, after a lot of agonizing and arguing, and this was now a while ago, so thankfully the tech, some of the technology has caught up with some of the problems that we parents face. It's so easy now. I just go type in, the cell phone is off during school hours, there's no texting past 10 o'clock, and guess what, my kids sleep at night. They're not, you know, waking up and, you know, bags under the eyes, you know, not able to get to school on time. So it just makes it easy for our kids to follow the rules. I, I'm excited mom to get a cell phone. My son went to wait till he was 12. And he knows that he can't bring it to school. He knows that it's off at night. But he's excited to have the technology. I'm excited because I'm not arguing with him. I'm not worried. So please use the technology that exists at your trip for parents who lives the free stuff. We list the paid for stuff. And then finally, I recommend that on your kid's cell phone and 
monitoring your computers that you use some sort of monitoring software. Um, I'm not talking about, you may not have heard of spyware, but there's something that literally you can see every single thing that your child writes. I don't advocate for that unless you have a child that's proven to you repeatedly that they won't follow your rules and are engaging in very, very risky behavior that could end up with legal consequences. But I do recommend, and I use this, do use this software that brings alerts. For example, um, my son, I said I call Touch. There's a texting app. The texting app allows me to see concerning words. I want to know if my son broke a rule, I even don't use profanity, or someone that he didn't know texted him and said, call me if I want. Whatever the words are, there are alerts that you can get so that then you can have a conversation with your child, ask them about what's going on. And the same thing with the monitoring software on the cell phone and on the computer. You want to have an alert. I want to have an alert that comes to my, my phone or to my email that says these phrases will, were used. So that your child knows that, as my kids do, uh, they're responsible. They are responsible for what they do and say to another person online. They're responsible for how they use technology, and they know that my involvement is about helping them make healthy choices, and me as a parent helping to keep them safe. So all of the things that I've shared with you, you can do today and over a series of weekends or at night, and all of the information is free and available at your and the URL is right up there, yoursphere.com. Is that correct? And the final slide has resources on the bottom. Great. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pull that up for you shortly. Um, let's jump over to um, Crystal. What do you want um, parents to know about possible you know, legal repercussions or legal protections when it comes to um, online matters? So I think the question about legal protections is a big one because so far the laws have really just been trying to keep up with making sure that crimes are being dealt with, making sure that individuals are protected and staying safe. But the laws, <clears throat> there are some legislators who are more on the cutting edge and they're starting to introduce legislation to protect the victims as well. So rights that victims have, if you've been a victim of cyberbullying, if you've been a victim of identity theft, um, if you, you know, been a victim of some kind of a cyber crime, whether you're a school-aged child and that involves moving school districts, whether you're an adult and that's some kind of compensation that can be afforded to you, um, this is another issue of the law that's evolving. And I think Dr. Norwicki's point was exactly on point. The legal consequences are very severe, and like I said, your kids don't understand them. I go into the classroom, I can educate them on it, but what really, really makes the impact is your discussion with them. And we've done parent presentations as well. And it's also, you know, Yolo County is a very diverse county. We have a very highly educated community in Davis. We have West Sacramento, which is more of an urban community. We have our rural communities of Winters, Esparto, that can sometimes be very mixed. Um, and what parents are across the board saying to me is, I don't know all the technologies my child are involved in. I have no idea there were so many dangers out there. And then they also don't know about all the positive uses of technology. And you're not engaging with your children on this platform. And I totally agree with them. The way to you know, just improve your child's health, reduce their legal risks, is by being engaged with them, communicating with them. We can go in and give a one-time presentation out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> you know, a teacher can raise it in a classroom as it comes up. Again, a couple months later, everybody forgets about it. And this is what high school is like. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's kind of merciful that it can be so forgiving. But it's also a dangerous thing. You are there every day. You are the ones who, exactly like Mary Kay said, should be supervising and be involved with them. And the best way to eliminate your child's legal risk or significantly reduce them is to be involved with them. Be educated, and that's that's a huge part of this. You have to be really educated about two things. You have to be educated about the technology your child is using, and you have to be educated about the law. Because if you aren't educated about both of those, your risks are still out there. I mean, some kids aren't intentionally abusing technologies that they're facing. And, you know, what was it, a few years ago, the legal issues that we had with kids and technology was all the downloads from Napster and other sites like that, where the kids had all these civil judgments against them. That's kind of a past phase now. That's an issue that's working its 
itself out in court, and now we're talking about criminal issues. And who knows whether it will be a civil or a criminal issue, you know, two years from now. But you as a parent, if you stay educated on what the trends are and what the laws are, you can do that. And the, um, there's actually a state office, the California Office of Privacy Protection, that has a great website where they have information about current legislation, pending legislation, and they also have a bunch of links to different social media websites, very similar to your sphere with tips on you know, helping your children get involved in technology, risks and dangers that are out there. We've talked a lot about strangers, we've talked a lot about you as parents and even educators, but I think one of the things that we haven't talked about as much is the peer groups that your children are associating with online. Because sometimes that's very different than the friends you allow to come into the home or the friends that they associate with. And being educated about who that peer group is, a lot of kids are online with a range of people, adults, little kids, kids their age, individuals who are employed, individuals who are in school, and when you think about the exposure that they're getting, social media is about sharing your experiences, and they are being exposed to all of those different experiences. Being aware of who your kids or friends with are online, and maybe sometimes having some limitations on those is a huge step, because if you don't know, have the conversation with your kids about, you don't know, who that person is who's sitting on the other side of the screen. There's actually a really funny cartoon in Spanish that the Spanish government came up with along these lines where this girl is sitting online and she thinks she's talking to this guy, you know, um, she's sitting on a beach and she's like texting live photos of herself and she thinks she's talking to this young kid because there's a photograph of, you know, these are all cartoon characters of this young, attractive, buff looking guy and you know they're having this conversation and it escalates and it escalates and finally he's like, well, send me a picture of yourself. And so you know it kind of implies that she sends an inappropriate picture to herself and then the next screenshot is actually not just the screens, but the screen and the very hairy leg of the heavyweight, you know, older gentleman who's sitting on the, I shouldn't say gentleman, <laughs> who's sitting on the other side of the screen. And this is the reality, you know, about what your kids are actually facing verifying that person's identity and you know just not being friends with people you don't know and being educated and the resource was the state office of privacy protection yes. okay yes. so that and more square for parents are two places that you can go for some more practical tips um dr Nowicki, from the perspective of a medical professional um what practical tips do you want our parents to look away with today have family and kids <laughs> Talking with your kids. I mean, they're, they're, that, be collaborative with your kids. Um, you know, there's no way that you're going to know all the things that are going on. And that's a good thing. You, you want them to, to explore things so that they become individuals, but you also don't want them to crash and burn. The only way that that's going to happen, because as the technology changes, you can be up to date on this website, and your website's going to be updated. It's always going to be about, at best, six months behind, three months behind. Um, and a lot happened in three months. So you might have a child that identifies something that no one else is going to identify in the next two weeks or three weeks. And you can already crash and burn. But he could be also be behind this going, holy smokes, Dad, did you see this thing? Um, and you'd be like, oh my God, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's what you want to happen. They'll come to you and show you what's going on, or you have a conversation. So, what's the scariest thing you've seen on the internet in the last week? You can have a frank discussion. I mean, for you know, I'll ask those things. What's you know, when I see an adolescent in school or in my office who's having some challenges, I'm saying, what's the what's the gnarliest thing out there? Right now? Um, I go, what's our <laughs> Just to show that, yeah, I'm out of touch, and as much as I want to feel like I am, I'm not. And and say, but I'm going to come to you and, and understand what your world's about. We're going to work collaboratively on it. I respect you as an individual and as a human being, and I want you to be safe, and I love you. And all the data 
shows is that you know even though you have a teenager that's arguing and say and, and giving you that look of disgust and anything, and you know who chipped you out of the Stone Age ice cube, um, that really they are heavily influenced by your opinion, by your thoughts, and by your your input, uh, and and, it, and and they may give you that look of, oh, you know, it's nothing, and then they leave and go, mm, let me mull that over and I think about it. And it plants the seed. Um, and it's incredibly important. And it comes up over and over and over again in data um, of studies. And, you know, uh, working together with your kids, if that's something that's, you're like, oh, I don't know how to, I, I'm having difficulty talking about these things with my child. There's a good website that has great vignettes. It's a psychologist at Harvard named uh, Ross Green. www.liesinthebalancenospaces.org and there's vignettes on how to do families to come together on how to collaboratively solve problems. When we talk about, you mentioned arguing, and I smile. Um, because the, the flip side of arguing is debate. And we want to get away from arguing with our kids where we're in a strong position and you know, it's my way or the highway as long as you're under my roof. I mean, these are the things that I Those things, that's the paradigm that's going away. The paradigm of teachers sitting in front of the classroom saying, this is the, this is the knowledge I want you to take away from. You know, you have the guy saying, we have the dumbest people on the planet that we're raising because you can't rattle off 150 art history facts. Well, what's the use of memorizing all that stuff and within 10 seconds you can go on Google and know it? Or at least look it up again. And this is happening in medicine. I mean, we don't have to. We can look it up on our iPhone in the room and go, oh, these are the side effects. So it's, it's a great thing as long as you know that if you read it once in one place, you can't trust it. You have to really do some deeper searching. So talking with your kids, solving problems collaboratively with them. You sort of under your breath said, there are some things, some, they helped me make some changes on the rules and the contract. Yeah, we talked about that. And that's hugely important. Mm -hmm. That's the big part. You want them engaged in the contract. You want to say, oh, okay, that's a, you know, I can live with that rule. You know, we might have to come back and revisit it if it doesn't work, you know, work out, but I'm cool with running with that one for a while. That's a, really the important part, because the technology is the red herring, and it's going to change. It's going to be, you know, I think when they came out with the printing press, they had they didn't have mics and stuff. I'm sure they <laughs> Um, but it's the most rapid distribution of, in, of, of information in the history of this planet. We don't know about other planets, no, but it's, it's, it's going to change so much faster. You gave dates of how fast it was to 100 million people. I mean, it's going to be milliseconds. And, and personally, I love it. I'm an artist and inventor, and I can, you know, on YouTube learn how to do the wildest, craziest things. I'm, I want to build a car with an Indian car front suspension. In one evening, I knew how all that physics worked. Um, so it's incredibly powerful. You have to understand. I also have to wake up the next day and go to work. They know this and those types of things. So that's my big one. So it's kind of random. Steve, what practical quick tip do you have for, say, parents in your practice who ask you for recommendations on hours of screen time? Depends on the age. It depends on what it is. So um, I, I wouldn't have a screen in my home until after kids do it. I would try to keep it as real as possible in your house. No TV, no iPad, no DVDs. Right. For kids under two. Yeah, there's really no benefit. You want you want all that off. You don't want that distraction. You want people focused on faces. I mean there are kids that do I mean most kids will do just fine with that type of distraction. Mm -hmm. There are another 20-30% of kids who are really at risk for having significant language delays and social delays who are bombarded with all of this and they can't figure out is this real, are people are real, faces are real, social stuff. And then as you get older, the screen time changes. Is it a mind sink where they're just turning in some <coughs> YouTube video and really not engaged in it? Um, or is it really they're coming up with the next brilliant idea and throwing things together? How much is too much? Well, I hear about kids that, you know, the screen was saying 50 hours a week, that's way too much. 
Um, you know, I want to stay away from absolute numbers because I think it's something that is different for each family. There's going to be, um, you know, coming together and negotiate that. If you guys, if I say it's eight hours a week, and you have a child that's at 15 or 20 hours a week, and you immediately come home and it's at eight hours a week, and it's like going to be a nuclear bomb. <laughs> Um, and that's not going to help anyone. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help your child understand that. Um, if you see where the screen time is interfering with the sleep, it's not going to work. Yeah, you have to sleep. collaboratively sure. work on that. You have to say, I see this as a problem. What do you think? Well, yeah, I do have sort of crummy days when I'm up texting until 2 o'clock. Right? Well, what do you think? can we do something about that? Well, one, you can go and shut down all the time, which I think is, is great when you start from a young age, and that's sort of the culture that they're coming up in. But if all of you go home and shut off all that stuff in the middle of the day, there are going to be some nuclear explosions out there. Um, so you have to engage the kids. That's where you have to talk about what that contract is, what it's going to, what it's going to look like. Let them negotiate that, and then come to that ideal place where it's going to work for your family and for your kid. And then, so that when you leave school, so if you have a very authoritarian Thing in your home. When they're 18 and they leave for Berkeley or MIT or you know Stanford or you know Lincoln Tech or whatever, and they they have their own apartment and, have, and then they take all this stuff. They won't know how to manage it. Mm -hmm. They'll have their own little mini nuclear bomb when you, they come home a semester later going, I flunked out because I just I didn't know what to do with all this stuff. Um, so so that's that's why I'm not going to give a number. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, people will give you a number of you know, two hours. You'll know, when, you'll know when it's too much. Isn't it like the rest of their lives? Moderation. Yeah. Everything it's moderation. It's like exercise, yeah. fats, foods. That's our course. It's just like any other thing that we can be easily compelled to do, obsessed with, <coughs> and that is when we're starting to disrupt the positive expectations and the positive aspects of life, when it's disrupting the schoolwork begins to slide. When friends disappear, it's too much. It's too much. Um, I'd like to take some questions from the audience now. If you have questions that you've written down in your cards or you need a new card, um, please pass your questions to the volunteers that are walking around. We'll be collecting them in the next minute or so. Um, in the meantime, as those questions are being collected, please join me in welcoming the co-chairs for today's program, Karen Lake Sloan and Jody Lederman, to the stage to say a few words. Good morning. Community-wide parent ed K-12, who presents the Parent University uh, lecture series, is already working on our next program. In the fall, we'd like to continue the conversation by bringing Clifford Nass of Stanford University to Davis. Uh, Nass, we just saw in the film Digital Nation, has done extensive studies on multitasking and should be ready to launch his new book, hopefully at our event. So as you know, these types of programs um, where was I? Yeah. We need, see that's why I lost my, I was gonna, I was gonna pitch you guys. Um, at these types of programs, we, it does take funding. And, um, you know, we need to pay for the speakers, the facility, uh, publicity. So, um, we do want to thank our PTAs and PTOs, they, um, for allocating annual funds for our K-12 committee. We're in our third year. Um, but we also need support today so we can continue to offer these programs for free to the community. Today we ask that each one of you can please donate a minimum of a dollar. And if you can do that, if you can do more, uh, that would be super. For your convenience, we have a ballot box outside um, on a table when you walk and exit out where there is literature of all of our experts up here, they have left some literature, some information, so there are ballot boxes there. Drop a dollar or more in there. Um, and if you'd like to write a check, just make it out to YFRC, which is our pass-through account, um, and just put parent ed in the memo. Um, I'd also like to, um, one last uh, note, to recognize IRH, Institute of Restorative Health. It's a top-notch health wellness center here in Davis. We want to thank them for not only being a former sponsor when we brought Madeline Levine here from Stanford, but they um, they provide us the use of their office furniture for our stage show. 
So Davis connections are important. Thank you. I'd just like to take one moment to thank you all for being here. It's a beautiful Saturday. There are a ton of things going on today. So I thank you for making Paranet a priority. I'd like to take a minute to thank our wonderful panelists because I think they've shared some really valuable information with all of us today. And our fabulous moderator, Karen Lulu, thank you for being here today. I'd like to thank my co-chair, Jody Lederman, who is without her, this event wouldn't have been possible. And all of the Paranet reps here and not able to be here, um, these people come together once a month and create this programming as well as programming at your individual schools. And that's a very important job in our community to keep Paranet alive and well. So with that, we're going to move to the Q&A section, and then we will adjourn. Thank you. Do you have cards for me?
of eight-year-olds posting suicidal ideation and absolutely blowing up since the process of the school the following day. Children should have, at that age, should be talking to human beings mm -hmm. and not have a secret world in which they are functioning, in our opinion. Thank you. And to follow that, I think the, 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 the question, we should have a talk about it. This is what we learned. This is, we, I know you have it. You should be talking about um, what's going on. Kids don't know the difference if they are expressing themselves breast symptoms or suicidal thoughts. They feel that they are actually reaching out. Unfortunately, it's falling on no ears that can help them. Um, unless you tag it with something and suicide comes up, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> no, or what I was thinking in terms of monitoring when a site that does abide by the law, when a child, you as a parent have a dashboard and you can see everything your child has posted. Um, so you should be talking about that, of course. But if someone posts and you know you don't know that, the great thing is those sites that comply with the law allow you full access to see what your child's posted. And this is an opportunity for you to educate as well. I mean, you came here today and you got educated, but if your child has maybe other friends and you know their parents online, which I hope is the case, if they're suddenly out on Facebook, but if you know some of those other parents, you know, go into those other parents and be like, hey, I know that our child, there are friends together on Facebook, I just found out that there's this federal law, and you know, I found two or three of these other parents, I'm considering having my child join these sites, what do you think about, you know, moving over, so your child has some people who are making that move with them as well to help them in that adjustment and sit down with them and be like, hey, you know what? I just talked to so-and-so's mom and he's going to be okay enough to can count on, you know, your sphere or wherever. Um, and doing it kind of in a positive way where you're having a frank conversation with them but you're also helping them to make that transition. I have, here are two questions and they're, they're actually rather um, similar. This one says, you know, our son thinks he knows everything because he's 17. He has um, 900, 900 friends on Facebook and he claims there are protections for minors, so I don't need to worry. Um, I see that his peers also have several hundred friends. What to do? And that's uh, almost, I mean, it sort of ties into this question, too, that says, what are your thoughts on limiting a child's Facebook friends um, to say 100 or under, so they can only really accept true friends? Is there a way to limit the number of friends? The answer is no. There isn't a way. Well, no, but you, there's not a tool. To there isn't a tool to do so to on, on Facebook.com. Facebook. Correct. Uh, what do you think about someone having 900? I think that's a reflection of social media and how um, narcissistic it can be and how our kids are losing sense of what a real friend is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's a reflection of the reality that they met someone at a party or they met someone at a sporting event and they said hi and now they're on Facebook. So uh, it happens, it's far too common, but it happens. Uh, it's only particularly concerning they don't really know them. And as you mentioned, the, cult, the culture and the experiences that they're exposed to. So I'll, I'll mean to you to say, you, know, you don't want to pull the rug out and into all the 900 friends, but as, as sitting down and going through your child's friends and asking them who they know, how they know them. Once again, this is a collaborative educational process between the parent and the child. It is a values discussion. It is a it is a face to face discussion. It's intensely interpersonal. It allows the parent to learn much more about the Facebook account and, and who these people are. And it also it builds builds trust between the parent and the child that the parent can say, I'm not going to take away your friends. I'm never going to take away your friends. I do want to talk about what a friend is, what what friends I friend, and how I put my limits on. And see if we can come to something that is going to make us both feel safe. Kids respond astonishingly well to a question that is says, "What do you need to do so that I can feel safe? Please tell me what you can do so that I can feel safe." And they know, and they will tell us. They will tell us as teachers. They will tell us as parents. Um, you just have to hold your face really still because the answer is not what you're going to expect. And you have to look absolutely cool when it comes. <laughs> but, but if you say, what time do you think you should come home that I will know you are safe? That extension of caring, that absolute unconditional positive regard 
for teachers, for parents, we're all the same. We're all teaching, we're all parenting. So that unconditional positive regard to the degree that I will protect you and we are going to have to work together at it. That night, those 900 friends is a fabulous conversation. <laughs> okay, so this, 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 this question ties into that too. You're talking about coming from a place of caring as you talk to them. I have a 12-year-old son at Birchley. My son says, how come you don't trust me? How do I explain um, why the internet is being limited? I, I think that this is an issue where I am, as a parent, I'm glad that I have the legal training that I have because quite frankly, sometimes I used it in my parenting and it's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, you know, that last question and this question both reflect on the questions that our kids are answering us. And as parents, our immediate reaction oftentimes is, well, I'm the authority, okay, here's my statement, get ready for it. But sometimes the best response is not always a statement back to them, but another question. Do you really think that I don't trust you? You know, I've given you these opportunities. Do you really think I don't trust you? And then if the child says yes, but you know, I do trust you, can you think of other reasons why I might be setting this limit or why we might be having this conversation? What about other people? What role do you think they play in my concerns? You know, and at responding to your child with questions, not only is it not coming necessarily from a place of judgment or being completely authoritarian, but it's helping them to process and think. So just as Dr. Norwood said, when they go off to Berkeley or they go off to Stanford or they go off to another college, they're not just sitting behind a screen being like, mom would say no, click. Um, you know, they're being like, wait a minute, you know, why am I doing this? Why? Is there a better option? Is there a better solution? You know, how do I respond to this? And they're not just doing something automatically um, in regards to it. I've, I've said to my kids, well, trust has to be earned, first of all. It's just not given. Um, and and with, with the internet, you know, I said to my kids, look, the, the internet was, and social media wasn't created with your know, well-being in mind. Um, it's, it's a wonderful reflection of all the great things that exist. But unfortunately, like the rest of the world, there's all that other really bad stuff. So with technology, I need to, you need to earn our trust, and let's take it at baby steps. I.e., the example I used, we started with an iPod Touch and texting there. Once my son was able to show me that he could text responsibly, then he graduated to a non-smartphone, and then the next will graduate to a smartphone. Um, and so if you explain to your kids that there are things content that will come to them that's there that they may not go out and seek that can put their privacy at risk, safety, etc. If you explain to them that, and that's why the, this is why we're limiting the things that you can do um, so that they learn along the way. Um, I, I shared with my 12 year old son about you know, the college scholarships that were lost at the NCAA athletes because of what the boys posted on Facebook. And I said, Jack, before you post anything, when you're in college, because he's going to be on, you know, be on Facebook, I want you to think, why don't I have that conversation with me? You know, maybe this is one of those times I should just not post. So at least we've given them, we've had the conversation, they're involved with us, they're understanding that there are consequences, and they may still make that mistake, and they'll be adults, they'll need to, like all of us, learn from their mistakes, but we haven't been given the opportunity really to have that dialogue with our kids. You mentioned one thing that trust is earned, um, and that's really true, and it's, and it's gained through setting limits and, and encouraging them to be independent and, and, and building that. But one thing that's not earned is respect. Um, and, I, and I think that touches a little bit on the first response you have is, you don't trust me. What do you mean? Of course, you know, or, or just cutting them off and not listening to kids. So. Respecting children helps them respect themselves and helps them respect others. It also builds empathy. Um, so that if you actually listen to your child, I hear you saying that you feel that I don't trust you. Well, what's up with that? I don't, that that's out of, I don't, that shocks me. And I, and I want to know why. And so you're going to listen to your child. You're building that. You're, and that's empathy, respect. And then as they also you have to earn their trust. Um, so that's the other side of it, is that they have to be able to trust you to be able to share 
something shocking or scary or something and trust that you're not going to fly off the handle as what they'll say. You'll make it such a big deal about it or you don't understand. So those are statements of, well, I want to I want to understand and I want to understand where you're coming from and then we'll work on it together. So then there's trust built the other direction that then they can, if they're encountering something that's scaring them, they can trust that you're going to be there to help them and be safe. We have just a couple of minutes left to um, get through a few more questions. So quick answer here. This is uh, Mary Kay. Are kids able to undo safety settings that parents put into their phones or other technology? Um, with the iPhone, um, no. Uh, so you're in charge once you've, once you've set it, it's set. And yes. Do, and and if, you, can if, unless you give your child the passcode. Oh, don't do that. You know, it's a four-digit passcode. So, and, and, and we have step-by-step -step picture instructions. Step-by-step uh, -step picture instructions on on how to set how to set the settings. You know, but I'll, I'll just share with you. Um, I'll share with you that. So, for example, we don't allow um, our child to you know have you know explicit lyrics. And of course, he didn't like that idea. But we had a conversation about you know why explicit lyrics. Oh, you mean listen to music with explicit lyrics? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can set the settings so they can't download anything with explicit lyrics or. Is there uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's my old estate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that comment was gnarly. So, <laughs> so I'll just, on some of the, the texting, um, I wrote an article that was published on yesterday, or the day before, on um, the, the apps to stop texting while driving. The free one, your kids, for example, could undo that text, that application that would allow them to drive um, and text. Some of the paid for ones, they can't un undo it. So, uh, so content filters on this. No, you can control it as long as you keep the password. Uh, and of course, everything is age, age appropriate. It's nice to know probably that you can set limits for apps for those nine and under, twelve and under, and then seventeen and above, and as well as lyrics as well. So there's a lot of room for customization. There is. How does the app know that you're actually driving? Is it is it is it sensing the motion? It's G it's the G. Yes. Okay, so you can tell that you're moving fast. Yes. Yeah. And I, I would just add to that, that is one way to help your child and protect your child, right? But that's only one. And the, the dialogue and the conversation becomes really important because your child might have those security settings on their phone, <laughs> but do the other kids on the fifth grade playground who have the smartphones, you know, your child might not have the smartphone, they might have a simple phone, but what do they have access to through other people like I said, I've gone into some of the more rural communities in Yolo County, and the parents have no internet at home, not because they're against it, but because they can't afford it, or they just don't have access where they live. They have a basic cell phone that they have with them that work all day, and they're like, my child has a Facebook account somehow. And so that, you know, this is why the conversation and the dialogue are so important, because you can take those steps, but taking them with your child becomes really important. Um, so that they're thinking about it when they're using other people's phones who don't have those same guards or filters on them. Here's a um, question about the Frontline show. Maybe Karen can answer this. Is that Frontline show still available on the Frontline website? Online? It is. Okay, so Frontline PBS, and then you can find us. Great. Let's see the entire thing, and it also has additional links to further conversations with some of the, some of the experts and professors that were highlighted. Okay, so if you go to the PBS, it's probably pbs.org frontline site. Um, the name of the program is Digital Nation. So for the audience member who asked about that, you can find that. You can find that there. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, yes. <laughs> and um, another question here. Please give the name of the website um, that has the laws regarding technology and social media. Again, that was the State Office, California State Office of Privacy Protection. It's the State Office of Privacy Protection. It's through the Secretary of State's office, and they don't have this easy URL for you to memorize. <laughs> you can Google so your name. you need to Google it, and you will get to it if you Google State Office of Privacy Protection or you know children's or laws or things like that. Um, and it's not the most user-friendly website. I think um, someone from Parent University was talking about making it available on their website as well, potentially. So it would be a link that you can connect to from there. Um, one more question. Um, this person writes, I've just um, finished um, reading a book that ends on a particularly hopeful note about the power of the virtual world to organize for action in the real world. Um, what gives our expert panelists the most cause for hope? What is hopeful about technology and how can parents support that? I've seen a lot of really great things. I'm so inspired by the kids. 
a girl who was her own, uh, who started her own group called Lemonade Warriors, and she's a member of North Fair. And she's using social media and her blog to help <coughs> educate other kids about, um, she, started selling, she started selling lemonade, made money, of course, donated it. Now she's teaching other kids about how to have philanthropy parties. There's another uh, girl, um, her name's Katie. She's Katie, Katie's Crops. And Katie is uh, helping kids in other communities grow their own garden. She gives tutorials, kind of some videos, and then they donate the food to you know, communities in need. Uh, we have a young writers program at North Square. We have over 60 young writers that have had the opportunity to interview celebrities. Um, we've had their work published. So, as I said earlier, social media is a wonderful media, it's participatory. There are many, many good things um, that kids are doing, and they're able to connect with other kids around the world, be exposed to different cultures, uh, have different conversations, and their education can extend beyond the classroom. Uh, education is at their fingertips, and I'm very hopeful because I believe that we're raising you know, it's a very smart generation. And I believe also that, I know my parent will tell you it was tough when I was raising you. I believe our job is tougher because our parents didn't have technology. We're the digital immigrants, our kids are the natives. But I'm also here to tell you that the time is over for us to feel overwhelmed because there are solutions now. And the exciting part is we're right on, we're right in the middle of it. We're, we're, at the, we're at the top, we're at the top, we're at the peak, and so many good things ahead with parental involvement. <coughs> with that, I'd like to thank our panelists for being with us today and sharing their, their wonderful knowledge. Thank you to all of you.